welcome to the meeting of the Town Council, March 9th, 2020. Um, could we please have the roll call by the clerk? Chairman Adams? Here. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. And Councilor Straw? Here. And now we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, any town council reports or correspondence at this time? Yes, Councilor Jordan. Um, I just wanted to uh, let people know that the uh, town council ordinance committee meeting is at, um, on March 11th and it's going to be at 6 p.m. and not 7. So we're gonna start at 6 p.m. and it'll be right here in the council chambers. We're at the point where we're doing our next uh, full review of the uh, short-term rental ordinance and um, so uh, I look forward to seeing uh, my usual crowd. It's been a great group of people as we've worked on this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yes. I'll just follow on to that. that at um, last week's meeting of the Regional Voice Committee of GP Cog, there was about a 45 minute uh, discussion involving um, some other communities, including Freeport, uh, on the topic of short term rentals. Good. And there's a woman uh, on the staff in Falmouth. Uh, I'll, I'll get the, I don't have the electronic copy yet, and the, the printout was like literally microscopic. But when I get the electronic copy, I'll forward it to everybody that um, this woman in Falmouth had put together a grid um, spreadsheet that showed basically a quick overview of all of the short term rental um, key points of ordinance. Um, in most of the communities in southern and, and coastal, mid coast Maine. Wow. Um, so, for comparative purposes, Freeport doesn't have an ordinance right now. They're just embarking on starting one. Um, so, but we had a lot of good and healthy discussion. And I think GP Cog is interested to, you know, lean in a little bit more in terms of um, maybe crafting sort of a base ordinance that then communities could take and at least um, build upon and, and model um, their own after. So. Uh, anyway, it's a topic that generates a lot of interest and attention, not just here at Cape, but elsewhere, and um, we may benefit from, from some of that ongoing discussion as well. Thank you. Um, anything else? Um, so I have just one note. We learned that the counselors were all invited last month to a very special birthday. Um, Apparently, Mr. Seth White, who's been a resident of Cape Elizabeth since 1940, turned 107 on February 26th. So we wish him a belated happy birthday. He is apparently the oldest resident of Cape Elizabeth. Um, okay, with the permission of the council, the next item would be the revaluation update. Um, Assessor Sweat has asked that he be able to present that after. Um, that's out of the order that's laid out in the town council rules. So unless anyone objects, I think it's a good idea. He does have a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. okay. Um, wonderful. So we'll take that up in a minute. So we can move right on to the finance committee report, please. Uh, so before you in the packet is the usual um, monthly dashboard as well as all of the control documents. Um, nothing of uh, sort of out of the ordinary to report this month. All of our um, key line items that we uh, track and report on in the dashboard from key revenues and expenditures are all um, either in, you know, pretty much in line with expectation or uh, trending very favorably um, to our benefit. Uh, so, unless anybody has any questions on the report and the dashboard, um, the only other thing I'll mention is that next Monday and Thursday uh, will be our municipal budget review with department heads. We'll be in here in the council chambers. Uh, the meetings on both days will be um, videoed uh, and broadcast and then archived for um, playback if you miss the meeting. 
Um, so we'll be going through all of the uh, municipal cost centers and the budget recommendations from staff uh, with chance for question and answer and, and so on. It's a workshop type format. Um, so if you're interested in following along with um, the initial look at the fiscal 21 budget, that's uh, what we'll be doing next week, Monday and Thursday, seven o'clock, both meetings. Any questions for finance? Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, we now have an opportunity for any citizen to raise an item not on the agenda. So if there's anyone wishing to speak to something not on the agenda this evening, this is your opportunity. Now, seeing no one, we will move on um, to the town manager's monthly report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'll begin this evening's report with announcing that after 40 years plus of dedicated service to the town of Cape Elizabeth, Bob Malley, our beloved Director of Public Works, shall be retiring. Bob is planning to work through July and I know that we will all wish Bob well and there'll be, I, I would hope and assume, numerous occasions to do that over the upcoming months. Uh, when that day comes and he will leave a tremendous void, that will be a great challenge to fill to, and that is the understatement of the year. The election last week was run exceptionally well. I wanted to express our gratitude to Deborah Lane and her election staff for their efforts. Uh, we've, we've taken a lot of time to work and I know Deborah has uh, taken great efforts to, to learn from last, uh, last November's election and to try to come up with some creative approaches on this and you'll, you saw some of them deployed last week. Uh, with much planning and testing on these new measures, we're striving to be prepared for what is anticipated to be a record turnout in next November's election. And that was the first of three elections this year. This morning, all department heads were present for a full organizational discussion on the town's preparedness for responding to the crisis, the health crisis of COVID-19, which is challenging government, health, and public safety organizations. Discussions were held on proper measures for sanitizing work surfaces, high traffic, public facilities, hygiene issues such as washing hands, as well as preparing for responding to operations that may be impaired due to quarantine efforts. I want to ensure the people of Cape Elizabeth that Chief Gleason and EMA Director Charlie Kennedy, as well as our staff, are currently in frequent discussions with the state CDC and Cumberland County EMA on best practices and preparedness. We find that it will be best to be able to respond versus react in these types of situations. Responses to the request for proposals for the solar power project at the recycling facility are due this Friday with, energy committee, with the energy committee planning on reviewing the responses shortly thereafter. We are anticipating a, a high level of, of interest due to the mandatory walkthrough that was held a week and a half ago. Finally, if a person is interested in entering the lottery for one of the highly coveted and desired boat racks slots at Great Pond, the lottery entry closes this Friday, March 13th. Uh, to quote the Hunger Games, may the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> uh, respectfully submitted, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, any questions for Matt? No. Okay. We'll move on to a review of the draft minutes from our February 10th meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan. Um, any discussion? All in favor? unanimous. Um, so this is where we'll, uh, Mr. Sweat has requested a deviation that we take up item 39-2020 first and then receive his report. Is that acceptable to everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. So item 39-2020 is the confirmation of the director of the Thomas Memorial Library. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, Matt, would you like to cue this one up? I would love to, Madam Chair. Thank you. It is my pleasure this evening to bring forward Rachel Davis as the next town, uh, Thomas Memorial Library uh, Director. I know uh, Rachel has been with the town for 27 years, and I think that's been the best apprenticeship that one could ever ask for because uh, she walked in to the job uh, a little over a month ago and it seemed as though she had been there for the better part of the past 27 years. Uh, she's been, she, we went through and advertised for the position uh, opening. We had a number of people who expressed interest in it. We interviewed a number of candidates. Uh, all along, I will say, I held in the back of my heart that uh, 
Rachel was going to be interested. And then after we went through the interview process, she expressed her desire, I think, after test driving it as interim for a short period of time. So uh, after uh, discussing that with her, she accepted the position, and uh, that's why we bring her forward this evening. And we're extremely proud to bring her forward, and she's here this evening as well. So. Uh, all we would need would be any council questions I'd be happy to answer or uh, if there's anything else I can provide for information. Um, let's perhaps take up a motion first. Do I have a motion to confirm the town manager's appointment of Rachel Q. Davis to serve as the director of the Thomas Memorial Library effective immediately? I so move. Councilor Devereaux, second? Second. Councilor Straw. Um, any discussion on this item? No. Um, well, we're all very appreciative. <laughs> Thank you for stepping into this role. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thanks. Um, all right, so now taking up Mr. Sweat's um, item, which does not require any council action, but it's just an overview and status of the upcoming revaluation. Great, thank you. Naturally, with technology, things are working great here. <laughs> it worked earlier today, <laughs> trust me. Well, while this is spinning up, um, <coughs> let me say as this presentation, uh, well, first of all, thanks for giving me some time to, to speak to you and the public about this reval. Uh, this has been kind of cooking in the background for the, the past year. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation that someday I'll be able to present to you uh, <laughs> is available on the town's website um, and certainly um, you can review it. If any of the public has any questions or comments, uh, my email is, is uh, very easy to get to. So if I can do a song and dance for just another minute or two while this spins up, we'll be ready. That's a good sign. And counselors, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to stop me and ask questions. Uh, we can do it that way, and you can also ask me at the end as well. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, so the reval is scheduled to start this spring. Um, let me give you a brief history about revals here in Cape Elizabeth. We've done one in 2003, 
and then another market update in 2011, and now we're uh, scheduled to do one this summer. Um, this will be a uh, complete internal and external reval. We'll knock on the doors, uh, need to measure the exterior of the home, uh, come inside, uh, if you'll allow me, uh, verify uh, the, uh, the bathroom count, seeing if the basement's finished, uh, checking for uh, depreciation, uh, quality of construction. Um, there will be myself and two other field agents completing this task. Um, we're also going to be capturing uh, solar features on the homes. Uh, that's because the state of Maine is for the first time allowing uh, taxpayers to apply for an exemption on these uh, panels. So before we can exempt them, <laughs> I've got to value them. So uh, we're gonna capture that during the reval process and then I'll reach out to those homeowners with the exemption applications for them to fill out. It's a two-year project. We'll start this spring, wrapping up uh, in 2021. Uh, you will not see uh, the new values until 2021. So it's basically a two-year homework assignment, and then we'll finish it up uh, the end of 2021. I'll also update the uh, building cost tables, and that's the, the cost of uh, basically how the, the building is constructed. Um, we'll equalize neighborhoods based on sales ratios, and we have to do it because it's required by the state. Once our ratios get so low, the state says, it's time for you guys to do a reval. So, so we're there, and we're gonna move forward. Um, talking about the, uh, the internal uh, and external visits to the home, uh, like I said, we're basically there to, to verify plumbing fixtures. That's what we base the value on, uh, square footage uh, and physical depreciation of the home. And also to see if the sketch is, is accurate. Other towns have recently done revals. Um, you can see that it's, it's kind of a costly endeavor. Uh, we're spreading the cost over three years to help lighten the, the load. Um, this is the solar, uh, the solar exemption that I talked about. Um, as of this week, the state has just released the applications uh, to this program. So um, it's, it's, I can't really roll it out until I see who has solar panels. So, so we're working on that. Next thing I'll be doing is updating the cost tables and that's the cost of construction. And since uh, the year 2011 to current, cost of construction has, uh, uh, has increased approximately 25%. And that's the cost of labor, it's materials, it's the soft costs, architecture fees, permitting, uh, all those fees have gone up. Um, and we also use the uh, National Industry Standard, Marshall and Swift, to update our building tables. Uh, that's uh, industry standard, so we're, we're not making this stuff up. Um, talking about sales ratios between the neighborhoods, I'm not gonna get into the weeds too far. Uh, borrowing my, uh, my cat's laser pointer, um, you can see that town-wide we're at 73%. And if you look through the neighborhoods, everybody is around you know, 70%, 73, you know, we don't have any real group that is uh, way out of whack, which is good. This way we can basically raise all the ships kind of equally, so that's a good thing. Yes? What's uh, Shore AC? Um, uh, that's Shore and Waterfront. Got it. Shore Acres. Shore Acres. Ah, yep. And then Waterfront. Yep. Yep. And these are just some sample sales from certain neighborhoods. I'm not gonna go through all the neighborhoods, but you can see Broad Cove, here's a couple sales. 
a few sales from Mitchell Road. Shore and Oakhurst area. And we're also gonna uh, look at condominiums, obviously. Kind of the same thing. We're right around 73% with all of our condos. Um, some of the, the uh, ratios are a little bit skewed, but that's what we're doing the reval for. We'll, we'll get those all evened out and cleaned up. And here's just a few samples of some sales of uh, condos. Um, looking at the sales ratio for single family homes, you can see that we last did a reval in 2011 and the values were at 100%. And over time, you can see the, you know, the, the ratio is going down. That means that the, the value of the homes are going up. Um, another thing that I want to point out about this graph is the number of sales. You can see it's, it's pretty robust. We have a lot of sales. Um, which is a good thing. It's, it's good to have something to hang your hat on. So, and then basically the condos, same thing. Uh, trend line is, is heading down and number of sales is quite robust. So what are we looking at for a timetable? Uh, me and my uh, band of appraisers will be hitting the field this spring. We'll be doing uh, field work until April of next year. I will then take time to uh, come up with a valuation, working on the building tables, the land tables, and doing analysis. And that'll probably finish up the summer of 21. In the summer of 21, that's when you'll be getting your value change notices, um, what your old value versus new value. Then you'll have a chance to come in and talk to me if you'd like. Uh, certainly it's, it's mass appraisal and, and we do the best we can, but there's always gonna be areas where we need to tweak. So if you get your value change letter and say, well, you know, how do you come up with this? Come on in and we'll talk about it. We'll see what we can do. And then finally, mission accomplished. Uh, We'll get things all put to bed by August of 21, create the tax bills and send them out. Yes. For the field work, I mean, is it literally you guys going around and knocking on doors or is it setting appointments? Is it having people? Yeah, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, divide the town up into thirds. We're gonna go knock on doors. Um, if we don't get an answer, we're gonna leave a door hanger and say, you know, call the office and schedule a time to, uh, to have us come back. Um, I also want to tell the public that if, um, you know, if you're home alone and somebody knocks on the door, you're not comfortable, you know, with the encounter, just say, you know, can I have your card and, and call back in and reschedule it. You know, we're, we're all about customer service. We want people to feel safe in their homes. You know, just because I knock on the door doesn't mean you have to let me in. Um, and yeah, we can certainly uh, work around that. Yes? Is there a plan to um, make any announcements in the courier so that people might be aware that this is on the horizon and yeah. not be surprised yeah, by you? Yeah, we're going to do uh, some outreach, uh, get, the, get the article in the courier. Uh, I'll head out to some local uh, Lions Club and Rotary Club meetings and, and push the information out that way too. Um, and I understand that uh, we've already got some updates on our website about it, so, excuse me. So yeah, we're, we're gonna get it out the best we can. And also as far as, um, you know, updates from, from us, you know, quarterly, I'll be coming in, giving you guys an update, letting you know how things are coming along, how far we've progressed. Uh, you know, just keep you guys abreast. So. Can I ask it? Yes. Because um, you kind of alluded to this. Um, is there going to be something distinct that 
uh, identifies the people who are doing the appraisal. So if yep. somebody were to say, I had this person come to my door, they said they were doing an appraisal, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Um, is there something very distinct that uh, yes. people what, should look for? Yep, what we're gonna do is I've got uh, magnetic door uh, hangers. That I, I have some for my truck. I'm gonna order a couple more to, to give to my other field guys. Uh, I'm gonna take them across to the police station and get them some IDs, so they'll have some official uh, town of Cape Elizabeth IDs. Okay. Um, and yeah, I can also get some uh, JPEGs of their, of their faces and, and we can put that out as well. But uh, yeah, they've, uh, they, they've done this before. Um, I, I know uh, it's Bob and Tim Gingras with Parker Appraisal known them for years, they're great guys. They're also certified main assessors. Um, they actually assisted in 2003 with our uh, last door-to-door -door reval. So they, they know the town um, and we're very confident with, uh, with uh, this pair, so. I have another question. Yes. I assume that you're also, you also look at um, properties that are under tree growth on agricultural easements and things like that and in order to yep. incorporate, okay. Yep, we'll look at all, all those things. Okay, yep. good. So you probably wanna know, how much is this gonna cost? <coughs> well, like I said, it's spread out over three fiscal years. The majority of the costs are in uh, some software upgrades that we're having done and some uh, analysis software that I, I purchased. Um, Another line is uh, for the field appraisers. Uh, you know, they charge $40 a parcel, which is kind of the going rate in the industry. Um, legal fees, consulting, mailings. When all the dust settles, uh, about 180,000. That's a, I consider that a conservative estimate. So I'm hoping to come in under that. Um, but it's always good to do the do what you can. So, about 180,000. So, what benefits to you in the town? Well, we're compliant with the state of Maine, which is a good thing. Also, it creates equity among neighborhoods <laughs> and property types: single-family, condos, vacant land, uh, different neighborhoods. Uh, it's going to lower the mill rate, which is a good thing. Um, usually what happens during a reval, we, we have what's called the axiom of thirds, where a third of the properties go down value, a third will go up in value, and a third will about stay the same. That's statistically what usually happens. Uh, and then my, uh, my, our assessing database, I kind of take personal the, the database. It's gonna have some upgrades. Uh, we're gonna have the ability to print property cards, which will be nice. Um, currently, if you want a property card, our admins go and pull the card out and, and scan it and email it. Well, now we can just fire off a PDF and send it, which will really uh, be a time saver. Um, digital sketching of the homes. Currently, it's all uh, pencil and ruler which kind of makes me nervous in a 100-year-old school building. If all that data is lost, I'm out there measuring every, every single house again. So we don't want to do that. Get them in digital format, we can back them up. It's better for data security. Um, also, they're gonna give me uh, better reporting. Um, and, and even with these updates, our uh, assessing software is, is far cheaper than, than what's on the market. So. We're, uh, we're, we're being uh, thrifty with our, our spending. Uh, I mentioned exemptions. Um, currently when the, when the ratio goes down, that affects your exemptions. Um, last year, homestead exemption was 20,000, veterans was 6,000, and the blind was 4,000. But you only saw 17,000 of that homestead, 5,100 of the veterans, and 3,400 for the blind. That's because we have to adjust these numbers by the ratio. Um, following the reval, these numbers will be whole again, uh, and actually this year, 
they're increasing the homestead ex exemption from 20,000 to 25,000. So that's a good thing. Now this year we'll have to adjust that 25,000 by the ratio, which this year I'm estimating it to be 82% down from 85%. So you'll get a little bump, but, but still it's, it'll be good to, to have it at 100%. And that is all I have. Um, certainly entertain any questions. Any other questions for Glenn? Oh, one other thing. Um, when we're out in the field, I'm going to make sure that I communicate that to the, uh, the police department just so they'll know what neighborhoods we're in. So if they get any calls, you know, hey, you know, creepy guy in a gray, you know, Colorado pickup truck, well, they'll know that's me. And we'll have the signs on the truck as well, so they'll know what's going on. Good. All right. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda, item 40-2020, is the Fort Williams group use um, beach to beacon. This was on our agenda last month. Um, it was referred back to the Fort Williams Park Committee. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Um, okay, so on January 16th, 2020, the Fort Williams Park Committee voted six to zero on various group uses at the park to include the Beach to Beacon 10K road race, um, which will be July 28th to August 1st with a group use fee of $27,500 and expressed an intent to revisit that fee in March um, for years after 2020. As I mentioned, this was on the town council agenda last month on February 10th. The council referred it back to the committee. Um, the committee has now sent it back and again um, unanimously approved recommending the $27,500 group use fee and to revisit this for years after 2020 um, moving forward. So, yes. Move that we accept the recommendation of the Fort Williams Park Committee for the 2020 group use fee. Second. Any discussion on this item? So, I see we have Jim here. Uh, so I, what, I, what I would like to hear from, uh, if you're willing to be the representative from the Fort Williams Park Commission, is how did you arrive at the 27,500? Um, in, in particular, if you can explain how you arrived at that under our group use policy. So the, uh, my name is Bernie Shore Road and I am the chairman of the Fort Williams Park Committee. So to answer your, answer your question, um, two, two questions there. How did we arrive at the 27.5 and then how did that apply to the group use policy? So two pretty different questions. First thing we looked at when we did this back in 2019 for the 2020 fee, so that's when we established it and then voted on it in January of uh, this year and then again this past month, was we looked at the $25,000 fee that has literally been was established at least in 2012, if not well before 2012. It was supposed to be revisited in 2016 for the race in 2017. That did not happen for 2000, so 2017, 18, and 19 got away from us. So we went back and said, if we applied a 2.5% rate of inflation to that fee, the $25,000 fee, that um, would have started in 2017, that then gets us to the 27,500 number. So it was our attempt to catch up to where we should have been. And then there was further discussion about what it would be going forward. So at that point, we had actually proposed that we did had a 10% increase for each of the next three years. And looking forward, would cover our basis so that we would have a documented fee schedule with a roadmap for the Beach to Beacon so the team so they could set their budget for the long term. We get feedback from the public and we get feedback from the race officials on both sides, too high, too low. We bantered it back and forth as we always do, looked at a number of different variables and decided that we thought that our math was correct, that it was the right fee, 
but because the Beach to Beacon Committee needed to get their race on the books for this summer, we should just bring just that first number, the 27-5, forward to the town council, get that approved so that they can go run their race, so to speak, and then we would come back and look at the out years in, the, in, the, in our next meeting in March. So that's how we got the 27-5. Your next question was, how does that pertain to the group use policy which was established in 2012? <coughs> and the policy, basically, we, we have a fee structure for every event at Fort Williams based on either um, the kind of the size of the event, we take into account kind of the nature of the event, and then the other thing that uh, really drives a group use policy is for how long and what area of the park are you, rent are you renting? The exception to that is for unique events. The only unique event that we've ever had while I've been on the committee and looking back to some of my associates that have been there for longer, we get a visitor here. Um, we have, we have, the, only, the only time we've ever invoked that special event is for Beach to Beacon. And, and, and furthermore, the, the, the policy actually says that in the event of a, of a unique event that requires special fee structure, that actually then falls to the town manager yep. for establishing the fee structure. Nonetheless, we, we recommended this fee based on what we know the costs are, what the inflation rate was, and where we when, where we need to be down the road, and also, uh, you know, courteously providing a, a roadmap for the beach to beacon so that they can set their budgets and at least get this race underway and financially organized. There is one other unique element, and that is since the establishment of the race, they've actually come back and they now start their race preparations on Thursday. There are a number of additional events. So in addition to the $25,000 fee that they've always paid, they actually pay Fort Williams Park an additional $2,400. And so the proposal was to take the 25, we increase that by 10% to catch up with the rate of inflation. We add the $2,400 for the additional uh, venue that they use, for the, the cost of the additional services that the park provides, and also for their liquor license. And then that then becomes the new rate. So the $25,000 plus the 10% plus the $2,400 actually comes to $29,000, $2,900. And that is the rate that we had proposed back in January we visited and now are proposing February and in March. Does that answer your question? Uh, so yes, excellent summary, thank you. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted uh, to hear. Uh, so it sounds like you took the approach that Jamie had noted was one potential avenue, which was you used 2015 or 2017 as your base yes. year, um, which that's one thing we wanted, at least I wanted to. Uh, get our head around, so that makes sense. Um, and you also touched on the other aspect, um, which I, I realize I, I have a tendency to put process uh, perhaps before it should be, or uh, give it too much weight. Uh, but uh, as you noted, uh, under the group use policy for the unique events, the fee isn't set by the uh, park commission, it's not set by the town council, it's negotiated by the town manager. So um, I hear you that your recommendation is 27,500. That might be make your rationale, it's all there, but it sounds like under the policy though, the town manager is the one that's supposed to go and negotiate what the actual number is. Is, is that fair? That is fair. There we go. All right. Thank Do you. you have to add on that? If, I, if I may, uh, just to, to add uh, an additional level of detail to the expense that actually the race does uh, provide a level of, I guess, compensation that the race does provide to the town. Uh, uh, Dave Backer, who's the president of the Beach to Beacon race, uh, was at the last park committee meeting. And uh, in addition to that, I, I followed up with David afterwards as far as the overall expense. And it really comes closer to almost forty, almost $50,000 when all the checks are cut because there's the fee for the fort. There's also uh, an amount that's paid, and most recently it was $4,814 to the school department for custodial facilities and buses, as well as almost $7,500 for the police use for the day, 
uh, almost $8,900 for the fire use for the day and almost $3,300 for the public works crew that assists with labor uh, in addition to the site fee. So uh, when, the all, when it's all said and done and all the checks are, are written, it ends up being just under $50,000 uh, to, to, to bring the race forward. And then the final part that I would have is that uh, the, this is probably, I know it's the only race in Maine that's certified green. And that's a, a point of pride that the race has taken as far as being uh, uh, trying to leave the park a better place than when, than when they arrived. And uh, I know from being on the board for a number of years, uh, that is something that they've strived for and has been really a, 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 a mark of honor. So uh, just to hopefully that brings uh, additional level of detail to the council. So then last point. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, to recap, uh, Thank you guys so much for all the work you put into this and the analysis. Greatly appreciate it, especially bouncing it back and forth. So I, I do greatly appreciate the hard work you guys do. Um, so I guess what I would be willing to vote yes on, because uh, I think all of us agree, like, yes, we should approve this. It's just a matter of what the fee sh structure would be. So the motion as it stands, I'll vote no on. But I would be willing to vote yes on, approve the use, and then uh, uh, direct the town manager to negotiate the fee structure per the group use policy. Yes, Councillor Deborah. Be before you sit down, um, <laughs> Jim, I, I really want to thank you and the committee for all of the hard work. Um, I think what happened at the last um, council meeting was that I know for myself, I didn't have any of the paperwork. I didn't know how you came up with the fee structure. So that was my concern. How did you come up with it? And going to your meeting and hearing everybody talk about how they came to that number, it really helped me make my decision by knowing that. So thank you for doing that. The other piece is that at the last meet, at your last meeting, you had said that you were looking at a five-year um, increase. Is, are you still looking at that? Because I thought you said 27.5 up to about 30, we were, up to 35 in we five were years. Three-year structure. Oh, it was a three-year. So 10% over each of the next three years. But that, so we are revisiting all of that. That never made it this far. So we get feedback from the race, and we said, okay, let's get this year set. Okay. When we have more time. We will get through the rest of that. So now the question is, do we get to that or does Matt get to that? We'll work on that together. But I just want to say, I, um, going to their meeting, they've spent um, pretty much a year talking to different people, meeting with people, discussing this. So they've put a lot of time and energy into this. And I really appreciate all of that work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're good. Any other questions for Jim? Can you just read back the motion before we vote, so? Um, read back the motion. Uh, the, the actual motion before we vote. Did the motion include the number in it, or is it just to approve the, I don't recall the exact wording, or? It's not on the, uh, on the agenda. I believe it did include I the think, numbers. I think the wording of my motion was to accept the recommendation of the Fort Williams Park Committee. Got it. For the, um, for the group use fee. Um, and Matt, is that group use fee something that the manager approves of? I, th I think it seems very reasonable. <laughs> yeah. um, so at, at this juncture, <laughs> Madam Chairman. <laughs> all right. If there's no further discussion, um, all in favor of the motion? <laughs> all opposed? Um, uh, it's four. I'll, I'll make it unanimous. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to more. Um, and, and perhaps we could revisit at a later date <laughs> yes. the wording of that policy. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so moving on to item. Just as a point of information, we're accepting the, the recommended number. It has nothing to do with execution of the actual policy. Oh. So the Fort Wings Park Committee recommended what we should charge them. That's what we have just accepted as that recommendation. The actual logistics of who negotiates that and everything is still, I think, valid under the policy. So, thank you. Um, item 41-2020, um, group use fee request making strides walk at Fort Williams Park. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? 
Seeing no one. On February 13th, 2020, the Fort Williams Park Committee unanimously approved the American Cancer Society Making Strides Walk, on, which will occur on Sunday, October 18th, 2020, with a group use fee of $700. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendation of the Fort Williams Park Committee to approve the group use for Fort Williams Park for the American Cancer Society Making Strides Walk on Sunday, October 18th, 2020, with a group use fee of $700 as presented? So moved. Do a second? Second. Councilor Jordan. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, all in favor? It is unanimous. Um, item 42-2020, consideration of memorial bench fee at Fort Williams Park. Um, anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Um, so, Looking for a motion on this, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approved the recommendation of the Fort Williams Park Committee to set the memorial bench fee for memorials at Fort Williams Park at $1,500 per bench. Do I have a motion? So moved. Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, any discussion on this item? Yes. Uh, so um, I'd love to hear from <laughs> Jim again. Uh, my recollection with the children's garden is even just a small paver, it was much larger than this. So the number, it seems like it's missing a zero from my perspective. I'd be much more comfortable with 15,000. Uh, so what discussion happened with respect to this? My recollection is we have a very long list of people that uh, were interested in benches as it stands, such that it seems like we could bring in a lot more money if we set this price a lot higher. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and we, we we did talk about where we where we had come from with our prior fees, what the cost of these benches are, what we could extract if we wanted to, but we felt that at this point we th there is and, and you're right there is a list of people who over time have expressed interest in memorial benches. We have not gone back and uh, looked at that list. I think the last time Bob Malley was what. <laughs> 36 people on the list, but, we, but it hasn't been touched in years. So that doesn't mean that there are 36 yep. still current yep. people who are looking for memorials. Um, the price for us to have these benches installed is uh, $1,075, $1,100. We do some maintenance on these every now and then. We change out the plaques, we clean them, there's graffiti. We, try to reseed or restructure the soil. So based on the numbers we got from public works and based on the cost of the benches, et cetera, we figured our cost with some uplift for the town really is $1,500. Did we try to turn this into a more significant revenue making opportunity? Uh, we, we did not. There are efforts within the park, for instance, the, um, you talked about the pavers, that was yeah. to raise money for a specific project. This is actually for benches that already exist. So those benches exist as a result of the work that we did within Fort Williams in 2019 when we restructured the whole central parking and all of the, the walkways and the drainage down to the lighthouse property. So the benches are there, and that's the, we, we thought that was a, a fair fee so that anyone that really wanted to participate could participate, whereas if it was at a zero on it, they would, most people would not and could not participate at that point. <coughs> Councilor Garvin. The, these are just your regular park benches too, right? So I, I, I saw it from benches, the, well, yeah. not only that, but I saw from the, 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 the distinction between these type and then the, there's the more ornamental like granite kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, we are That's, not program to put any more uh, of the uh, marble or granite benches in right now. So, so just standard park bench with a little plaque that we're plaque. familiar with. And Thank we you. do replace those plaques yep. to make sure that they're readable for families. Any other questions for Jim? Um, I have you. One. Um, you said that it was about $1,000 plus maintenance. Were you looking at five years of maintenance, 10, 20, how did you reach your maintenance numbers? Okay, so we, we just said, you know, it, it doesn't cost a whole lot to replace those plaques. Some, I mean, it's, it's literally in the tens of dollars to replace the plaque. So it's probably a 10 year number. 
but then there's some benches where there's erosion that need extra dirt, you know, land or uh, soil brought in. So it's, it's different for, for every bench and every location. And, and we, we hope to do more eventually about, you know, through the uh, cliffside landscape. And, but this is to get these benches paid for and contribute back to the work that we did in 2019. Uh, any other discussion on this item? No. Um, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, so all in favor of the motion. Um, so that's six and opposed, one opposed. The motion passes. Um, moving on to item 43-2020. Um, so this item is to consider the ordinance committee recommendation um, of a short-term rental permit moratorium. And before moving on to the public comment period, I just would like to note that the anticipated or recommended action um, of the town council is to set this item for a public hearing. Um, so the intent would be that uh, this item would, I don't see the date on my agenda. Uh, uh, April, April 13th. April 13th. So it would be April 13th public hearing at which time um, we would expect significant public comment. Um, but for this evening, it would just be consideration of whether to set it for a public hearing. Um, so I saw some hands moving. Is there a motion at the ready? Is there public comment now? Are we going to do public Oh, I'm sorry. Comment? Yes. Yeah. Is there any public comment tonight? to comment. My name is Doug Dransfield. I live at 48 Richmond Terrace. Uh, I speak in favor of the Ordinance Committee's unanimous recommendation that the Town Council adopt a moratorium banning the issuance of new short-term rental permits effective June 1, 2020. I don't think there's a need for public comments, uh, to be honest with you. The Council should also immediately address the problem that exists with non-permitted short-term rentals. Completion of the ordinance revision need not be completed to begin action on such a matter. Acting to prevent non-permitted short-term rentals would show the community that the council sees this as a significant problem and intends to correct it. A public announcement of the moratorium and the commitment of the council to curb abuses of the current ordinance should follow. Prospective purchasers of Cape Elizabeth property must know that the council is committed to the stated purpose of the short-term rental ordinance as stated in the current draft revision. And I quote, in order to preserve the character of residential neighborhoods, to minimize the negative impacts of unsupervised tourism activities on adjacent residents, to maintain housing availability for long-term residents, and to protect the public safety of visitors and residents, the operation of short-term rentals must be constrained. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> any other comment this evening? Okay. Um, seeing none, so just to provide a little background before we get a motion on the table. Um, on October 16th, 2019, the council referred to the ordinance committee a review of short-term rental regulations. The ordinance committee has met seven times to review ordinance amendments. And on February 26th, voted three to zero to recommend to the council that a moratorium be adopted banning the issuance of new short-term rental permits, um, which are required under cur current ordinance requirements um, after June 1st. Renewal of short-term rental permits that are current would still be allowed. Um, so for this evening, the town council will be considering whether to adopt that moratorium, um, which presumably would be to give the ordinance committee a little more time to sort out the appropriate course of action recommended to the council moving forward. Um, Do you want a motion? I, if we have discussion, I'd like a motion first. Okay. Um, 
I move that we consider setting a public hearing on adopting the moratorium banning any new short-term uh, rentals after June 1st, 2020. The proposed moratorium would be for 180 days, effective June 1st, 2020. Do I have a second? Councilor Garvin. I'll second and just clarify by adding one word, short-term rental permits, which is oh, missing from you. the wording here. So just so that there's no confusion. Thank you. The issuance of new short-term rental permits. Uh, all right, Councilor Devereaux, did you have a comment for discussion? That, that, uh, that was my question, whether it was permits and whether it was um, adopting, a, whether we're setting a public hearing. Yes. It sounds like this is for a public hearing. Right. Okay. Yes, Councilor Gabrielson. Um, just a couple clarifying questions. So we're setting this to public hearing. Are we also setting the date tonight? We're setting for the public hearing? Yeah. The public hearing is our next council meeting, I believe. Yeah, yeah setting the date for 413 may be important to include that in the motion, Madam Chair. Right. Okay. Um, and then this may be a question for Matt. Um, I'm just curious, um, we received a report I believe in the fall of a number of businesses that were operating short-term rentals without current permits or valid current permits. And I'm curious, um, two things. One, are we anticipating if we set this to, if we enact this moratorium and uptick in permits issued before June 1 as a result of people coming into compliance? And then, a, you know, I guess building on that, have we already seen any of that um, additional short-term rental operators seeking permits as a result of the discussion that's happened thus far. If I, if I may, through yes, the chair. Yes, uh, I believe that we will well, we are anticipating an uptick in uh, applications, I guess, if, if the moratorium is adopted uh, between now and that, and that date. I know Ben anticipates that as well. We have not seen it as of yet. But they are. But is the it is the season for those to start flowing in at this present time? So uh, we have a normal flow, but we do anticipate that we hope to we hope and anticipate to see more legitimate operations uh, come forward at that point in time, consistent with those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilor Deborah. It's also my understanding from um, attending the ordinance committee meetings is that a lot of the unpermitted. Um, short-term rentals are homestays, correct? Mm -hmm. So they aren't required to get permits is my understanding, correct? Right. Okay, so they aren't someone who's not in compliance. They're just not required under the existing ordinance to get permits. Yeah. Right, the existing ordinance stays in place. Okay, so this would be this is the intent is of our discussion at the uh, ordinance committee meeting. Um, we started looking at different um, options and opportunities to try and address some of the current issues. And where we landed was uh, one of the areas that we could really uh, impact in the near term was um, the um, banning of the new permits in order that we could ideally, um, I would say, help manage the problem or not have the problem getting any, any bigger. Um, and so th that was the intent because um, it's, it's going to be several months before we really land on what will that uh, final ordinance look like. Yes. Yeah, to follow on that, I think the idea here is that with the anticipation of changing eligibility uh, of property types um, to be able to be used for short-term rental, that at a minimum, this would um, prevent new entries into the market, um, you know, for somebody that might jump in and then literally just several months later find that that property is then ineligible um, for the type of uh, operation that, that they intended for it. Um, so it, it has a, a small effect of curtailing growth of the activity. 
it has the secondary and, and I think beneficial impact of hopefully bringing some people off of the sidelines that are operating outside of the um, current regulations. But as you point out, you know, many of those multiples of listings are in compliance with the current regulation. That regulation is likely to change in some way. Um, but it, just because there's 150 plus listings doesn't mean all of those are required to be permitted under our current regs. Um, but for those that should be permitted and aren't, hopefully this will draw those people into compliance at least in the near term, so. Um, Penny, did you want to amend your motion to include the the word permit and the date of the public hearing, which would be April 13th? I will amend my motion. Um, it should read uh, short-term rental permits, new short-term rental permits, and um, that the public hearing would be held on April 13th um, here in the council chambers during our council meeting. Um, do we have a second for that amendment? Councilor Garvin, and we can just go ahead and vote on the amendment at this point. All in favor of the amendment? It's unanimous. Um, okay, is there any further discussion on the motion on the table? No, all right. Um, all in favor? It is unanimous. So that public hearing will be April 13th here in the council chambers. <coughs> Item, dash, uh, item 44 2020, receipt of audit results, fiscal year 2019. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Uh, seeing no one. Um, the council and school board met in workshop session on January 29th, 2020, to review the results of the fiscal year 2019 audit results prepared by Runyon Kirsten Willett. The boards also had the opportunity to ask questions. There are links available in this evening's agenda and the documents available on the website if anyone wishes to review those. <coughs> Do we have a motion to um, acknowledge receipt of the results of the fiscal year 2019 audit ending June 30th, 2019 as prepared by Runyon Kirsten Willett as presented? So moved. Councilor Garvin and Councilor Devereaux second, thank you. <laughs> Any discussion on this item? Yes, Councilor Garvin. I just wanna again commend the staff um, and the auditor um, for their work and um, it's great to see the improvements made year over year. Um, so congratulations and nicely done, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, anything to add Matt? Just uh, extremely happy uh, to get to the point where we are at this uh, right now and uh, to see on the track that we are heading is, is is satisfying and very happy to have the staff we do. They work really hard to, to get this together and, and continuously working to improve. Great, thanks. Um, all in favor of the motion? It is unanimous. All right, moving on to item 45-2020, um, vote authorizing expenditures for school renovations. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? No, seeing none. Um, so this item is relates to the, uh, the Department of Education had notified Superintendent Wolfram that the town had been awarded funding through the school revolving renovation fund to finance expenditures of up to 390,400, I'm sorry, 390, $429,000 for renovations to Pond Cove Elementary, Middle School, and High School. Um, Bond Council Jim Safian, or Safian? Yeah, Safian. Safian has present, prepared a vote for town council consideration to obtain a loan through the Maine Municipal Bond Bank School Revolving Renovation Fund under the Maine School Facilities Finance Program in an amount not to exceed um, that amount of expenditures noted for of which the town anticipates that 30% will be forgiven and the town will be obligated to repay 70% of the balance of the loan. Um, do I have a motion um, as laid out in the agenda? Not, not going to read through all that. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gabrielson. 
Um, is there a second? Second. Councillor Jordan, um, any discussion on this item? Is, yes. Um, is there anybody here to explain what these are? <laughs> oh, Jamie's here. Um, so, may I? V yes. Valerie and I are both on the building committee, and so this is something that came out of the work, um, an opportunity that came along um, in the process of doing the needs assessment work and subsequent recommendations from um, the engineering and architectural firms. So <clears throat> the, um, the school revolving renovation fund is something from the state that they make uh, application available to um, if you have projects that uh, they have priority one, priority two, priority three type designation for different projects. Um, most of that prioritization is based on sort of critical safety needs, critical infrastructure needs, things of that sort. Um, each project can be up to, um, individually up to a million dollars, I think I remember. Per facility. Yep, uh, per facility. So we were in the fortunate position as a community of having just had the engineering and architects go through the schools and make a fairly detailed punch list of a bunch of things that needed to be done. So even notwithstanding the conversations that are ongoing about what renovations need to be done to the schools for the long term, what potential replacements, when, and all that kind of thing, these are immediate and critical things that need to be fixed even if you were to replace the buildings two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, the benefit to the community is that the loan is A, interest free, and B, paid back at a 70 cents on the dollar rate. So we're basically getting 30% free money from the state that we pay back over time um, that we can put to use immediately. These have to be ready to go projects. So the advantage, that the, the sort of first mover advantage that we had over a number of other communities that may have been applying for these same dollars is that we had very detailed specifications about what we needed to do, when we could do it, and that it was ready to go because of the work that was done from the needs assessment. Okay. Whereas other communities might say, oh, that would be nice to have that money, but gee, what would I what, what project could I pull together and legitimize you know, the need for? Um, so it was really just a, a fortuitous you know, convergence of circumstances that we'd been doing all this work to look at the schools and that we were made aware of th this opportunity. Credit goes to Marcy Weeks over in the school business office. She's been very dogged about identifying these types of things and really you know, turning over the couch cushions and shaking out the, <laughs> the change that's there um, in dollar amounts large and small, this is this is a bigger one. So um, there, there really is no downside to this. It's work that needs to be done. It's not necessarily CIP work, but it's work that's needed and necessary in the buildings. And we get the advantage of, you know, a, a, a much reduced rate to get that work done, so. Okay, thank you. And also um, some of the, some of the items that were flagged for renovation through this fund, um, Marcy had noted are things that could potentially be carried over to a new building if we end up moving forward with that. So she's really thought through it carefully. Um, did you have a uh, Just to note that the lion's share of the uh, amount is for the high school, which the building committee, my understanding, is looking at Pond Cove in the middle school. And if you crunch the numbers with the discount that we get, um, even the small amounts spent on Pond Cove in the middle school, even if you said, oh, well, if we're tearing the building out, why are we doing this? We, with the discount from the loan forgiveness, we still come out ahead, so. Yes, Councilor Deborah. My, um, my only question is there's no um, maturity, interest rate, terms, we don't have anything like that. And it says that um, chairman of the town council and the treasurer would determine that. Um, I just have a question, has anyone dealt with this before? Are there typical interest rates or maturity? It says five and a half years. I'm just curious um, how that's gonna be determined. So this is actually interest free. Oh, it is interest free. Okay. Yes. That's a good deal. Um, did you have something else to add? It is currently uh, in, the, in the proposed budget for the school for the uh, one of the first year debt services in there. Uh, is in their projected budget at the present time if the council 
uh, authorizes it to go forward at this point in time, so I confirm that as well with the superintendent so they, they are prepared and ready to move forward. But it is an interest free, and they do have up to five and a half years. That doesn't mean you couldn't pay it off sooner, but the term is up to that amount. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, any other questions on this item? Okay. So I think I believe the motion is to um, authorize expenditures of up to $390,429 for school renovations as laid out in the agenda. All in favor? It is unanimous. Um, item 46-2020, acceptance of police department grant. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing no one. Um, the finance director is recommending the council accept a grant in the amount of $6,356 from the Maine Bureau of Highway Safety for the Click It or Ticket program. <coughs> the grant has a match requirement of $1,589 that the police department will meet through educational programs at the high school, middle school, and family fund day. Do I have a motion to accept and appropriate a 6356 Dollar grant from the Maine Bureau of Highway Safety for the Click It or Ticket program through the Cape Elizabeth Police Department for the period of March 1st, 2020 to August 31st, 2020. Councilor Devereaux, do I have a second? Um, Councilor Garvin, any discussion? Do I have to wear my seatbelt? <laughs> 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 so. All right, all in favor? It is unanimous. Um, item number 47-2020, write-offs of uncollectible sewer liens receivable. Uh, anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing no one. Um, did you have some information on this? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about it, Madam Chair. Uh, John Q uh, would, would be here this evening, but I'm afraid he has come down with uh, the seasonal flu, so he, he would be, otherwise he would have been here to help us out on this. However, uh, one of the roles as municipal officials is your ability to discharge uncollectible uh, bills as they come. Uh, since this is a sewer lien uh, on both of these properties, uh, that, that's why this motion has been brought forward uh, for yours. Um, discharging them. Uh, we have two liens that are out there and they sit back there for quite some time. One is from 1989 to 1984 in the amount of $1,290.23 for a property that the town had foreclosed on due to unpaid taxes and took possessions of it. At that point in time, it should have probably been uh, discharged as the town can't collect from itself. Uh, the second one is a property that uh, was foreclosed on as well by the mortgage holder back in 2013, and that was in the amount of $359.62. Subsequently uh, to the foreclosure, the uh, mortgage holder then resold the property at auction, and the lien was never discharged. Uh, ultimately, this has been sitting on the books since 2013. These are old debts that have been uh, not gathering interest, but gathering dust. And so in order to clean the ledger, that's why John has brought these forward to, to be discharged by the council this evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, do I have a motion to authorize the town treasurer to write off $1,290.23 in sewer, sewer liens um, as laid out in the agenda? So. Councilor Gaberson, do I have a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, any discussion on this item? All in favor? Five in favor, all opposed? One opposed, um, the motion passes. Item number 48-2020 is the fiscal year 2021 municipal budget. Anyone from the council, anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Being no one. Um, Matt, would you like to intro this one? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, this week, it would have been this evening, uh, they had to run into a couple of uh, snags this afternoon, uh, but this week I will be delivering the hard packet to the council for this year's municipal budget. Uh, this evening I'll bring forward a few different highlights that we're looking to bring forward with this year's budget and that will be, uh, the council will be reviewing over the next, next couple of months. Uh, 
The current budget as brought forward contains some significant capital item purchases that we're uh, looking to, to bring forward. The capital plan for this year includes significant investment in our public safety infrastructure with investment in new police radios, breathing apparatus for the fire department, and the installation of new communications tower at the recycling center site. Additionally, the capital plan has a planned investment in the, in the installation of new LED lighting to replace the current uh, energy inefficient uh, lights that we currently have, uh, looking to have a long-term benefit to the town uh, from the cost savings. There is planned replacement of the public works tool carrier at an estimated 180,000, and phase three of Scott Dyer Road is, uh, reconstruction is planned to begin this summer, as well as an, uh, we had an estimated final com cost component of $110,000 for our match for the final paving. The capital plan also has replacement of the turf field for this coming year at Hannaford Field. This is offset in part by the, uh, by the replacement fund that was set up at its, at its inception uh, of $279,000 with the remaining $325,000 in this year's budget. There's also an exp uh, uh, the above items that I just noted will all be uh, looking to go through those via lease purchase agreement that we have done in the past. The benefit from that or the desire from that is to minimize the cost, the tax impact, but while providing uh, some stable, uh, stable expenditures over the next five years. There's also an anticipated expenditure of $400,000 for long needed drainage work to be done at, on Kettle Cove Road. Uh, that's been put off for a number of years, but it's at critical nature now. And now offsetting the capital increases is the capital expenses, the use of unassigned fund balance in the amount of $1.3 million towards capital improvements and continues the use of $300,000 against annual operating expenses. This will lower the current amount of unassigned funds, but keep the overall level of unassigned funds healthy and properly in line with current policy. Additional funding will be carried forward from the current fiscal year to offset the capital expense at roughly $580,000. Finally, the Fort Williams Park Fund will participate in funding capital expense in the amount of $200,000 towards additional improvements to paving and drainage at Fort Williams Park. Revenues from sources other than property taxes are also forecast to have a net increase. Residents have been buying new motor vehicles and thus monthly collections have been improving. The budget projects 2.3 million in excise taxes, which is $100,000 more than the budget for the current year. Community service revenues were also adjusted to further reflect the current tracking of revenues. You will note solid gains in community services revenues, specifically in Cape Care, as well as Richard's, Richard's pool fees. Revenue for pay and display parking fees at Fort Williams Park is estimated in the amount of $375,000 in year two of that program. Finally, in Governor Mills' state budget, there's a forecast increase in revenue sharing. Last year it was set at 3%, this year it's set at 3.5%, which, which is going to reflect a significant increase to the town, well overdue, getting back towards where we should have been for the past 15 or so years, quite frankly. <laughs> I look forward to discussing this as well as uh, many other items as we go forward through the budget process. I wanna thank all of our department heads for coming forward with all of their requests and getting their information to us and uh, look forward to working with the council going forward. Thank you. Um, okay, do I have a motion to refer the proposed um, municipal budget for fiscal year 2021 to the finance committee for review? Um, and that that actual budget will be forthcoming, hopefully, yes, by the end of the day on Wednesday. So moved. Councilor Garvin, do I have a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, any discussion on this item? All in favor? It's unanimous. Um, item 49-2020, Town Council Goals. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Um, the Town Council has met twice to review goals for 2020. We will be reviewing the latest draft this evening that is um, posted online for, for the public to review. Um, I will entertain a motion to adopt, edit, refer to workshop for further review um, for those Town Council goals. Is there a motion? Councilor Jordan. Um, I move that we um, accept the town council goals as uh, written. As written, was that what you said? 
written? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Councillor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion on this item? No. Um, all in favor? It is unanimous. Okay. Um, item number 50 2020, cooperative agreement with the City of South Portland relating to snow removal and vehicle turnaround routes on local streets. Um, the, the town of Cape Elizabeth and the city of South Portland have been working, oh, I'm sorry, any, any comment on this item? No. Um, the town of Cape Elizabeth and city of South Portland have been working together on a cooperative agreement relating to access on town and city streets for the purposes of snow removal and vehicle turnaround routes. Um, then the streets sharing a common boundary included in the agreement are Edgewood Road, Red Oak Drive, Stone Drive, and Cliff Avenue. The town's attorney has reviewed and approved the agreement and um, there was a, a memo with that, all of that information, I believe, in the materials for this evening. Um, so do I have a motion to authorize the town manager to sign the cooperative agreement between the city of South Portland and town of Cape Elizabeth related to snow removal? vehicle turnaround routes. So moved. Councillor Jordan, um, do I have a second? Second. Caitlin Jordan, any discussion on this item? All in favor? It is unanimous. All right, um, item 51-2020, um, <coughs> uh, th this would be just to queue up the item, um, in response to the state legislative action regarding dis single-use disposable bags and certain disposable food service containers, um, we'll be looking to refer our town ordinance to the recycling committee. Uh, any, just any public comment on this item? No. Um, so we're looking for a motion to refer to the Recycling Committee a recommendation on review, revision, or repeal based on recently enacted state laws re relating to single-use disposable bags and certain disposable for food service containers. Do I have a motion? Awesome. Councillor Devereaux, is there a second? Councillor Garvin, um, any discussion on this item? All in favor? It is unanimous. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I have uh, put the uh, the heads up to the chair of the recycling committee, uh, the former chair and the uh, staff person liaison to the committee. So they, I sent it all to them last week saying this is coming your way, I believe. I'll formally let them know tomorrow. Excellent. So Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Moving on to the last item on the agenda. Um, the annual evaluation of the town manager. Um, the town met in executive session previously to begin the evaluation and will proceed this evening. Any public comment on this item? So looking for a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to 1 MRS section 4056A to continue the annual evaluation of the town manager. Do I have a motion? So moved. I'll second. <laughs> Councillor Jordan and seconded by Councillor Devereaux. Um, any discussion? All in favor? It is unanimous.